Hey guys, this is uh, Nowhere Man and Del Crossby from DeucesCrack.com, and we are coming at you with episode 4 of Deuce Island. This may be the earliest recorded video in the history of Deuces Cracked. Um, <laughs> a whopping at 10.30am? At yeah, that's right, that's correct. Okay, it's the earliest I've ever made a video. Well, actually, that's not necessarily true, because I did make a video at like 5am once, but that was on the other end, unfortunately. Right. Uh, <laughs> all right, so we're going to finish this uh, first little piece of video that we had from Kevin, and then we've got some bonus footage that he recorded, which, uh, well, I'm not going to spoil anything, because, you know, it was it's it's too good to... Uh, I don't play it badly. <laughs> it's night and day, the difference between the two videos. No, just kidding. Yeah, it's it's pretty, it's pretty distinct. Um, so, you know... We talked about this last week. Uh, I'm playing a session here. I'm pretty tilted, so my play is subpar. But there's still some interesting spots that I get into that are worth discussing. Um, and, you know, I think that we got through most of the video. There's about 10 minutes left, and there's just one more hand that I thought was sort of merited discussion um, that was, you know, a pretty big pot. So... Um, you know, I've been I've been developing reads on the players at this point, and uh, yeah, this is where uh, someone says hi to me, and I completely miss it. So there's your shout. Oh out. yeah, there it How's is. It going? <laughs> there it is. You are now on the video. Good for that guy. Hopefully he's a uh, he's watching today and is very happy that we can analyze his play in this hand, which we may as well do. So he raises under the gun. That flop. Looks good so far. <laughs> uh oh. He has ace queen. He has ace queen. All right. By the way, I have I have to think that that feature on stars where you can check your hand afterwards has to be that has to lose people so much money in uh like future tilt or whatever <laughs> you know when you see that you're like oh, i would have flopped quads i feel like they did it just for that reason yeah i try i try not to think about it <laughs> but um yeah that's a that was kind of a that was probably an interesting hand if i had had the wherewithal to check the hand history i i didn't at this point i was kind of flustered trying to get another table going and i don't think that i was as attentive to taking notes mm -hmm. so um i i wanted to stop just real quick so everyone watching look at how often kevin takes notes during this part of the session and then wait till you see the next video that we have and compare the two yeah this is it really will be a pretty like it's a pretty obvious difference between my a game and my c game um and, and i don't you know I, it's I was going to say, I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, t uh, there are other parts to your A-game other than your decision-making process and how attentive you are to the other people at the table and how good and how frequent your note-taking is is also definitely a part of it and is certainly the case for you. Yeah. I mean, you know, I not using a HUD, I, I recognize that I need to make up for that in other ways. And so yeah. being a very furious note taker has always been something that I've worked on. Mm. Um, you know, this is obviously a pretty loose uh, raise out, out of the blinds. Um, probably even, you know, it's it's probably just a fold, but I guess I, I thought that this beach man guy was tight at the time. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately so this hand on the on the on the left is where i get into a lot of trouble um the tables i'm the tables are both playing pretty tight passive and so i feel like i can get away with maybe making someone fold you know possibly like limp fold or just knock out the blinds and play this hand such that i don't need to flop a whole lot to you know take it down i think that most of the time if i if i continuation bet verited taz will fold and Stalingrad will either ship it in with equity or he won't. But the times that I don't flop enough equity that I'd be okay going with my hand with Stalingrad, I'm not going to uh, continuation bet is my plan for flops. So I think that, and I think that that's, you know, I, I mean, it's not a good hand to be opening here. If this, if it were a suited ace, I think it'd be better. Yeah. But, 
you know, in this in this case, I think it's it's just a fold. Um, I'm getting impatient. These people are all very like <laughs> tight and passive, so I go ahead and open a hand that I shouldn't. Yeah. Um. Now, what I wasn't expecting to happen was to get called in two spots behind me. Um, which seems like completely standard to me for whatever reason. <laughs> every time yeah. I, every time I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm raising this lighter hand this time. Everyone at the table just, I apparently have a little marker that goes off that says, oh, hey, Jason's raising really light here. And everyone says, well, okay, I'll call. Okay. So now this is, this is the spot where I think things become marginally interesting, I guess. Um, I have a hand now Stalingrad limp re-raises. So I sort of, you know, I have to put him on a range. I smell Folding aces. would be fine. Yeah. I put him on aces, and not only that, but I've seen Stalingrad raise pre-flop. I know that he's not, you know, I, I know, and I think I've seen him raise strong hands. So I know that he's not slow playing. I mean, he is slow playing aces, but I, for whatever reason, would assume that he has the weaker part of his range, like the weaker aces here, because... Yeah, it makes sense. He's just going to... Yeah, I think that he's just gonna try and get a get a stack in before the flop with a limp re-raise if it's a limp and an over limp. Um, so my options here, I can fold. Uh, probably not the worst thing. <laughs> uh, calling I think is out of the question. Calling is like yeah. the worst thing I can do because then I'm gonna see, you know, if I call everyone else calling behind. Yeah, everyone's gonna call. So that leaves me with option three, which is to just go all in pre-flop. Um, and there's a decent amount of dead money here. Uh, you know, I've already there's already seven fi- or there's already ten dollars from before yeah. uh, any action has been made. So I don't think it's the and you know I'm only risking another ten to uh, if I can knock these guys out. And against aces, I'm doing fine. I I mean I I'm not an equity favorite, but I also just don't think that these guys are ever calling. Um, I, you know, I yeah. don't, I, I don't think that they're going to call with, you know, run like, you know, any sort of weakish rundown. I definitely know Ver, uh, Vertida Taz is not calling because he just limped and then called. He's not going to call like for his entire stack pre flop and the Sparrow, if he calls, I'm, I'm not happy, but you know, I, but uh, he would have, he would need a very specific type of hand. That he decided to flat here because he had a perfect opportunity to, you know, squeeze yeah. against the field with a hand like Jack ten nine eight suited or something like that. And if he declined that opportunity the first time, I think it's really unlikely that he's going to want to call another, you know, forty seven fifty cold at this point. Right. So I stick my stack in, and I think that that's probably, you know, once you've made a, a crit, you know, the the raise pre flop was was bad. And I should just fold. But once I've already gone that far, I think that jamming is probably more EV is more plus EV than folding. Yeah. Um, I I end up trying to run some pro poker tool sims on it. I was just um, gonna say that I think it would be a good idea for our audience to maybe run some sims on this to see what our equity against Stalingrad might need to be for this to be plus EV, and then to think about like how often other people would end up calling uh, yeah. before we're minus EV. And the other thing is, you know, I'm tilted. So if I get into a big three-way all-in, you know, all the better. Um, on the right, I get three-bet, and this guy checks the flop, so I opt to take a stab with a real hand. Yeah. Note that I'm, I am betting pretty small here because I want to make it, you know, I'm not folding, right? Like, I, you know, in an, you know, if he has the nut flush, then he, ha- you know, he has the nut flush. So I'm trying to size my bets such that I can get all-in by the river, but at the same time, I can make it look like he has fold equity if he decides to jam over the top at yeah. any particular point. Yeah. So definitely. I bet a little, or like about half pot, and then I think I bet similarly small on the next street, and I do, in fact, get him to jam. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I, if I were the pre-flop three better here and I were C-betting this board, this is probably the exact amount I would C-bet anyway. So right. I'm definitely down with the bet size here. Now, here's a question for you. What what is this guy checking the flop with? I think that if he has aces without a flush draw, he can check the flop here a lot. Um, you know, I I just think that I don't know that he's gonna want to get you know, given that it's just a three bet pot. There's still if he gets if he has dry aces here, um, I think that it's not a good spot to get stacks in when you're you know you're pretty far behind, and I'm probably not going to bluff raise him that often here. 
uh, you know, I don't know this guy. I don't, well, I mean, I haven't, I don't really remember, but I don't think that this was the kind of player that I would try and move off of a hand. Yeah. And the board texture is one that hits, you know, it's, it's one where against his range, I expect to get called a lot. So if he had Seabet and I had just a total air ball, um, you know, which if I don't have the flush, I, I you do, do have an air ball. <laughs> I'm just giving up for the yeah. most part. Um, I don't even know that I would bet I would continuation bet this flop uh, just because I think that he could even potentially call with one pair and then force me to barrel again. Yeah. So I think that this is, you know, I think that I'm not doing great against his range, but if I had, if I didn't have the flush in terms of trying to make him fold, but you know, the turn I'm sizing such that, you know, he can think he can move me off a hand. Uh, he goes aces, for it. By the way, rainbow aces, bad, bad, bad aces. But yeah, that's exactly what we thought he had. Yeah. So on the left, I, I mean, I, I did, you know, what I thought happened or would happen happened. Um, yeah. You know, I just didn't run good, which is fine. Um, and then on the right, I do get him to just spaz wow. out. Wow. Yeah. Dead. <clears throat> um, so that was helpful. Um, that made me feel a little better. <laughs> yeah. So. Trying, what do you think his thought process is here on the turn? Do you think it's just, okay, this guy bet the flop, bet the turn. I clearly trapped him. He's got nothing. So when I come over the top, he's going to fold his air. Because it's not like he beats anything. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the well, only thing he beats is a complete, like, he doesn't even he doesn't even need to have an ace here. The only thing he beats is a hand that's going to fold to his shove. Right. Um, I think that when he did that, he so I don't like the way he played his hand for a couple of reasons. I, I think he he perhaps thought that his he, I mean he does have a wrap on a monotone board uh, and top pair, <laughs> and he can somewhat try and represent aces, but the board does not cooperate. Yeah. If he had if he had made his straight, then maybe he could try and jam just to you know just because I might be betting like a a set here like if I had like a low set or two pair. I'm, but I'm probably not sure if gonna... I had a blocker to go with it or something. Maybe. Yeah, I just, I mean, I think that his play is just generally bad. I, I mean, there's not really much to say about it. Yeah. He should probably just bet the flop, and then you know, on a turn like you know, I think that the most advanced thing that he could do would be to check call a turn bet, and then if the board pairs on the river, jam. jam. Yeah. yeah. But I, I mean, I just don't. I, I don't think that he, the way that he tried to play it where he's jamming on a blank turn makes any sense because yeah. he's, I mean, I'm probably not going to fold, uh, you know, most flushes here, uh, especially with the queen high, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I wasn't, I was really surprised when I saw his hand. I wasn't sure what he was thinking. Yeah. The other thing about trying to do a uh, call flop, call turn lead river is that you're, uh, you're not drawing very well at that point. Like if he had had, you know, maybe two pair and yeah. wanted to try that, then at least he's got, you know, more outs to do something. But if he's got this and is drawing to the board pairing, like, you know, he has what, uh, three nines, three eights, two aces and three threes. So that's 11 cards that he's drawing. So he's not even getting odds you know if you want to call it that to bluff at the river and you're not necessarily folding yeah. so he needs to have something you know if, if you if you give him two pair then it's different because now at least he can be drawing to a hand that wins from time to time but even so like he can yeah. give up here or he i mean really i think he should just bet the flop and yeah i think that it. i mean the the best line if he decided that he thought he could move me off of a hand which is not something i rec i don't recommend trying to move people off of flushes without no. having a good read but i would if i were him i would bet flop check turn and then jam if the river pairs uh the only thing is if he's trying you know i'm i mean i'm an observant player so if he's trying to represent aces and an ace pairs it actually makes his line less credible yeah and i'm probably going to be more likely to curiosity call him just because i think that the number of hands that he could have that would be ace nine or ace eight is you know somewhat infrequent compared to you right. know, the aces which hands. aren't that great now because there could be quads on the board right yeah, so. so basically here, just bet the flop, and then if we decide to do anything, just be done with the hand. Yeah, I mean, betting the flop is fine, but I'd give up on the turn. I, yeah. I think that's. I think that trying to make a move here is not is ill-advised. Yeah. 
So, but hey, makes up for the other table. Well, I didn't lose that much in the other table, though. I oh mean, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that guy only had like twelve. That was stuff. that was one of the critical factors. There was that I was only risking twelve dollars to win twenty eight. Um, you know, in terms of my immediate or in terms of my exposure versus Stalingrad. If someone else comes along, obviously I look pretty stupid. But um, the but then you, you can't know, leave the, the table because you have an awesome image. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, the amount of dead money that was in the pot at that point, uh, I think makes it you know more justifiable and the fact that i don't have to risk that much versus stalingrad and i really just didn't think these guys were calling um so so yeah and you know i hate you know i wouldn't i wouldn't play at this table in general on the left i have deep stacks players to my left and short stack players to my right uh, it's just you know, and a short stack player to my right, rather. I, I, it's just not a good spot to be playing in. It sounded like a bad song lyric for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, I three bet the aces versus Kilroy. Um, it's a little. These are kind of on the weaker side to be three betting an under the gun open. Uh, that said, I'm deep with him, so I'm going to be three betting him a little wider here. Yeah. And. On a board like this, I don't know why I checked it back. I should be continuation betting here. Yeah. Uh, you know, if the board were very, if the board were drier, if it were six eight eight rainbow, maybe. Uh, this is a board that connects with neither one of our ranges. Um, right. so basically, I'm just giving up a free card to a flush draw by checking. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he's going to bluff raise me that often, and. So I should really just continuation bet there. If it were something very dry, like uh, you know, three three eight rainbow, then I I check that back most of the time just because it doesn't. I, I mean, I can give a free card and it's not going to hurt me. Yeah. Um, but in this is a case where I can I can lose equity if I had the flush draw as well. Like if I had if I was suited. If you have the backup to go with it, then yeah, it... then I think checking becomes more viable. But in this case, it's it's a definite spot where I should bet. We can... luckily I run good. So. Yeah. What are you gonna do if you bet and you get raised here on the flop? Um, it's kind of gross i i might call and turn tops full and then stack him that seems like a good plan yeah no i i think that i i mean it's a spot where this guy has not shown himself to be getting out of line so i could potentially give up just because i think that he's either going to have a hand like seven nine ten with a yeah. flush draw yeah or he's going to have an eight and against you know against part of that range i'm doing you know, okay, not great, but against the rest of it, I'm doing pretty terrible. Um, we're not so deep that I can just float and try and take it away on a later, like on, you know, float a turn or float a flop check raise and then, you know, make a move on a later street. Yeah. Um, Cause your I SPR need... would be, you know, two and a half or something like that on the turn, which would make it kind of tough. Yeah. You know, if we were, if we were, if we were maybe like, 300 big blinds deep or something i could consider floating a flop check raise here but even then i would want to have i would want something more to my hand than just a dry over pair like right, it's yeah. hand is not going to be good for that so okay. so yeah i think that i would just check fold. i think that i would bet fold here most of the time um and i think that's fine because i don't think that mo many people are going to open themselves up to uh bluffing this deep when I can have an eight. I mean, I'm going to be three betting him pretty wide here. Um, I make kind of, a, and then like my, I don't even really like my turn bet size. I think that if I am, if I'm going to bet that card, I should bet really big on it. And I should bet big because the times that I'm bluffing, I want to get maximum fold equity and I'm going to bluff. I'm like, if I didn't have anything, I'm going to be bluffing that card a lot. So you're probably going to bet that card like 95% of the time. Or yeah. Something. And if I'm going to bet it all the time, you know, I should be betting bigger. Um, I should be betting like $8, I think. Yeah. So. I th you know, it's funny though. I don't, it's not a big problem to have there, but you're just going to get so many folds in that spot because your hand, you actually still represent aces fairly credibly by checking yeah. the flop and betting the turn there. So um, <laughs> you're not going to get a ton of value in that spot anyway. But uh, 
I do think yeah. betting bigger is better. You know, both for the random times where he does have an eight or something, and, you know, for all the times you have air and you want to be like, yeah, I do have an ace, go ahead and fold. Yeah, the thing is, I'm going to, because we're deeper, I'm going to be three betting pretty wide in this spot, all things considered. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be betting, so I'm going to three bet a lot of kings and a lot of rundowns. And when I have a hand like kings, I think that I can make him fold a weak ace. Uh, on that turn card a decent amount like if he has like an ace with no real kicker and i kind of bomb that uh you know the ace i think he'll fold there a reasonable amount of the time just because even if i don't have aces i'm gonna have ace king a lot and with blockers to ace king i think it makes it you know a reasonable spot to to try and bet out would you bet twice if he called possibly it depends on how the river came out um if the river was a flush card i think i'm somewhat more inclined to give up because yeah. most of my flush draws would have bet the flop and i think that it's more likely that he peels me with a flush draw so now i'm really crushed by like the majority of his range yeah um, I, I think on a brick i'd be more likely to bet the river because then you can get yeah. his stubborn single pair hands to actually fold this time and i don't right. you know because i think he plays an eight differently at some point yeah um, and you know, I definitely, I definitely will go for thin value there if I have ace, if I have like ace king and the turn and the river bricks off too. So I have the best top two, I have the best two pair. I'm gonna bet twice there, mm-hmm. um, for sure. So, in case he is super stubborn, right? You know, I, I'm, you know, I'm either doing it for, I'm doing it for value just as often as I'm, you know, I try and make my value ranges pretty thin. That way, I can go for bluffs later. Um. I really hope I don't... Okay, good. I thought for a second I was calling on the left, and that's pretty bad. <laughs> you may uh, have hovered over it, but that's all. Yeah. I'm bet, folding. It. I'm bet folding on the right table. Um, my hand, the times that I get called, uh, I, I bring this in because I run a couple sims while playing. Um, my equity doesn't. My equity goes up by about 10% by folding out other players. Um, and so I think that that's probably enough um to try and win that dead money because i just think that they're folding there like every i was gonna say you know what 96 percent of this 40 percent is giving up maybe not that much but well yeah i guess that's probably right because you know of the of the entire top 40 percent of hands like two and a half percent of that is dead because nobody has aces in that spot at that point right yeah, and I think that I end up I end up clarifying I end up rerunning the sim as well versus like a top ten percent range, and then I'm I still have about third I think I I drop to like twenty seven percent equity three ways, but I just don't think that they ever have that that hand range. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fold. <laughs> yeah, you know I'm just. I'm just looking to get some, you know, that's the thing that I like about PLO is that it's, you can play tilted and it's not going to be the end of the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nobody listened to that. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, like you can play a lot of, like I shouldn't play this hand, but the amount of EV that I give up by playing it as compared to, you know, playing sure. like when I'm well, like when I'm tilted and playing the eight game, for example, I will lose money way faster <laughs> than when I'm tilted and playing PLO. So, um, I don't think there's that many more interesting hands here. Um, okay. do you want to just jump to the next bid? Yeah, that's totally fine. Just, uh, okay. all right, guys, we'll be back in just a second with the, uh, second video here. All right, cool. Okay, guys, we are back with the, uh, second part of the video here. And, right. uh, this is fresh, untilted Kevin. Yeah, playing, uh, so these are both pretty bad tables I'll, I'll talk about this pretty quickly um so i i was playing these for a little bit and if you notice i have notes on basically all the players yeah um at this point i'm developing i have some developed reads that i haven't actually noted yet but i think that the librarian is three betting me a lot in position mm-hmm. so i'm playing my i'm playing this position somewhat tighter than i might otherwise and i think that the matster is actually a little tight preflop so I'm not okay. so I'm kind of trying to take advantage of that. Yeah. Uh I made some kind of weirdish bad call downs when people were, you know, making really, really small bets. But it kind of gave me an idea for people's bet sizing and what they're sort of doing with their hands. 
Uh, so, and you know, as you can see, I, I have notes on pretty much everyone uh, yeah. at this. Point. What do you know uh, about uh, E. Martin? Since you uh, both your tables. E. Martin, I think that I hover over it. E. Martin was okay. playing pretty straightforwardly, so I wasn't too, I, you know, he wasn't doing anything to concern me. Uh, I think that, yeah, nothing, uh, nothing particular. I think that I'll hover over eventually, the notes eventually, so we'll see. Okay. Um, Here's a question. How long did it take you to get all this stuff? Uh, I've probably been playing at this table at these tables for uh, maybe 25 minutes or so. Okay. Um, and I'm watching. I'm just watching every hand. I'm checking all the showdowns. I'm seeing what happens. Uh, yeah. And you'll see the difference if if I were to go back and look at the other video. He's got you know Kevin has notes on maybe one or two people at the tables across the two of them at this point in the session last time. So you can tell how big of a difference it makes when you're really focusing on this kind of thing. And really, I mean, even if you are using a HUD, you should be able to do this kind of thing. If you're playing, I would say, what do you think, Kevin? Anything less than four tables, you should be able to do this? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you should you should play enough. You shouldn't be playing more tables than you can check the showdowns at, I think. Um, this table, so, this, so on the yeah. left, this happens, and I immediately make a read based on this hand. This guy donks into a 9-10 jack flop two-tone. Puff Puff Loco raises. So I'm just like, oh, okay. Um, uh, you know, he probably, you know, this might be like a big hand versus big hand situation. And so if we continue on, Black Cat three bets eventually. He's thinking about it. Yeah. Puff Puff Loco's cards hit the muck pretty fast. So what does that mean? Puff Puff Loco is bluffing there. You know, he has to be. Um, and given that, I'm going to assume that Puff Puff Loco is, you know, going to try and move me off hands post-flop. I don't think that he likes to fold, and I, I'm not sure, but I think that he's probably, you know, maybe a little too aggressive. I'm not, you know, I, I have yet to find out. But uh, in, in in like you know two hands or something, I think it comes up, you know. So we'll so we'll get to it. Yeah, and I I mean that's a that's a pretty interesting hand there, and you can definitely take a lot from just that one little tiny piece of information, and you'll see why having these little tiny pieces of information are super super helpful. Um. He just Obviously, raised that flop though, right? Not check raised. Yeah, it was a raise. Um, but he yeah he was in position, but it was he was raising a donk bet. Yeah. Um, so, and I I had to go back and check it just to make sure I because I think that I I thought it was a check raise at first uh -huh. too, and I just noted that he just straight up bluff raised. Um. I do like the fact that Black Cat led that flop actually. Yeah, it's a good flop to lead. Um, with when you're out of position, uh, you know, and the other thing is Puff Puff Loco was not 100 big blinds deep at that point, so I think that he should be leading a little wider there than he might otherwise, just because the you know the the value of getting it uh, the the tr it's a more of a catastrophe to give a free card at that point than it is to get it in, um, you know, when you're possibly getting free rolled. Yeah. So. Uh. On this left-hand table, would you raise this hand against a complete unknown? No, uh, I'm most you know I'm not you know I play pretty tight out of the small blind most yeah. of the time, but I felt like this guy was just gonna fold to any you know to most of my raises here. So and I think it's a marginally playable hand. Um, I'm not gonna raise total trash because I don't want him to realize that I'm raising close to. Yeah, we don't need to encourage him to be looser than he wants to be in this spot. Because he has such that, an advantage. Right. But I think that this is definitely a strong enough hand to want to raise. Uh, if I think he's folding the majority of the time. I have yeah. some... I can come to flops and, yeah. you know, C-bet and take it down or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. If he is that tight pre-flop, you know, he may give up a bunch post-flop too. So yeah. I think... I, I just wanted to make sure the point is made that... Uh, you know, this is not a standard open in this spot, and the reason Kevin opened here is because he said this guy was a good bit tighter than normal. Right. So that's this is a play that I'm making based on Reed. Um, so yeah. And he folds instantly. 
yeah. I, I, and I think that he's just, a, you know, I, you know, after 10 orbits or so, and I ha- I'm in that position a decent number of times, I think that he was just folding way too much. So now I have this hand on the button. It's very weak. I expect Matster to fold most of the time. And Puff Puff Loco, I'm not sure, you know, I've only seen him do that, make that one very aggressive play uh, post flop. But I haven't, I don't know how tight he's playing pre flop. That said, if there were a board that he was going to make a move on at me, this is it. So I'm still going to Intent. continuation bet here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, my plan is to continuation bet. Um, and I think I make it a pretty I, – I actually debate with che- – I actually debate about checking because I think that this guy is going to make a move here so often. But I don't have any equity here. I can never win at showdown, so I bet. Yeah. I bet, and I actually hover my mouse over the raise button. I don't know if you guys see that. <laughs> I hover it over the raise button because I am fully intending on snap three betting him. I do, and he instantly folds. So um, I want to talk about... Uh, let's talk about bet sizing here. Because I think I think the basics of the play here, you know, should make sense. Like, we know this guy's going to come over the top a bunch. He obviously obliges by, you know, check-raising us here in this spot. So we're going to three bet... Uh, Tell me about just over min three betting as opposed to making it say twenty five or something like that. Outside well, of the fact that we get a better price on our bluff. Well, just because he's just because he is you know just because he's bluffing a lot doesn't mean that he can't have a hand sometimes. So yeah. I do want to do this for as cheaply as possible. I want to make it look like I thought about it, so I don't want to just min three bet. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, I, I mean, I only click it once, but still. <laughs> and, you know, I don't think that, I think that if he had any hand that was worth check calling, like a, a flush draw or some sort of like king, queen, jack type hand, I think that he would just call with a lot of those hands or possibly even lead himself. I don't see him check raising with a hand that has like a lot of equity there when he's going, like if he's going to have to fold. I think that yeah. mostly he's going to be bluffing here, and so I'm just trying to, you know, take it down for as cheap as possible. Um, so you know. I want to I want to bring up the point of balance here in this spot because I think uh, I think a lot of people will look at this and say, oh, but you would never do this with Ace Ten. Yeah, or, I would absolutely. Whatever. But well, yeah, a I think you know you you might play it exactly this way with Ace Ten. The other thing is. I feel like in this spot, you're not really ever going to get re, re, re bluffed or however many re's it would necessarily be. That's right. be accurate. And it, I, I don't, this, you know, you've played what, 20 minutes of hands with Puff Puff Loco. If you well, had played like. Actually, Puff Puff Loco just sat down and I really oh, only okay. saw him play that, that one, one hand. hand. Okay. So I'm, I'm making this based on one hand. Maybe, okay. But... So you've played four hands with Puff yeah. Puff Loco. I think he, like, just posted. Um, He has no idea who you are or what you're doing. So right. for this particular bluff, especially because it's a bluff, we want to get the best price in our bluff as possible, who cares what we would do with quads here or ace-10? <laughs> Let's make the best bet size we can right now to make this work in a vacuum. And, you know, 15 iterations of this hand down the road when we've played you know like 700,000 hands together we can figure out how to balance our ranges and our bet sizing but here i don't think it matters in the slightest can i can i actually uh truth be told if i did flop quads here i would have time banked for like 10 <laughs> seconds and then min three bet um, so that's the balance part is the time yeah bank. yeah the time well that's act- yeah that's where i'm unbalanced is in my time banking um <laughs> I, so, you know, I, I was completely prepared for the, I was completely prepared for him to raise and I wanted to make my re-raise very quick there just because I think that's more scary to him, uh, especially from an unknown. So I, uh, I go for it <laughs> and, and I think that's standard. faster than you raise. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming this next hand on the left hand table, you fold because you don't want to get three bet by puff puff loco. Cause yeah, I that's this is my is... standard. I would normally open this, but again, Puff Puff Loco is going to put me in tough spots. So I end up playing some hands post-flop kind of passively just because I think that I'm going to get a lot of value from this guy oh, yeah. by playing hands 
somewhat deceptively and like you know just finding spots where he's probably bluffing way too much yeah uh, i'm not concerned about getting thin you know i don't think that against a guy who's pretty spewy i i need to concern myself with getting like really thin value when i think that i'm going to get most of my money from him when he makes big spews yeah um this hand on the left actually i think is kind of interesting i consider four betting here but we don't really get that much money in preflop yeah i think that and i think that his hand range is going to be mostly rundowns uh for doing this so if i'm going to if i'm going to have to you know i mean he i don't even think that he's going to three bet kings there that often this deep so if i'm going to make a play to like put a lot of money in i know this guy's probably going to continuation bet 100 percent of flops so i'm going to my plan is to call here and raise most dry flops uh and get the money in that way uh i don't really want to you know look i don't want to make it look like i'm you know like i have aces here yeah. every time and against a complete unknown if i four bet him here i think he's going to realize that i probably have aces so yeah you know i almost I, just, I think i'd be more inclined to four bet a, a big rundown or like an ace king queen 10 hand here than i would aces given our stack depth just because i think that does better against the hands that he's going to call a three bet with yeah. anyway the other thing is if he has a hand like kings i'm gonna have a much better chance of stacking him if i call than if i four bet yeah because uh, he's gonna fight kings most of the yeah, time if, so i i like this i mean so i call and uh the flop comes down, I mean, you know, obviously I flop top two, so I'm going with my hand. But if the flop had come, say, jack, five, six, I'm still making this same play. I'm still raising here and trying to get him to fold. Or, you know, you know, I'm I, the, the board is going to be pretty dry, so I'm just still raising. And I think that he's going to have maybe one pair here a lot of the time. What if there's a flush draw on the board? If like, there's a flush like say, draw on the board? Say, like, jack, six, five. With a flush jack draw. six five, I think that jack six five with a flush draw. It depends on which flush draw. You know, if it's a club flush draw, I might call and plan to represent it on a later street. Sure. If it's a, you know, obviously if it's a spade flush draw, I'm going with it. Diamonds yeah. and hearts, I'll probably call his flop bet and then evaluate a turn and possibly stick it in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. Yeah, that seems that, right. Yeah. I think that on a very and on a high carded connected board, like if the board had come, you know, jack ten, you know, jack ten seven or some sort of, or maybe even jack ten six, uh, any sort of queen jack king jack type board, I think that I can play more pot control there and possibly even just fold. Yes. Um, I think that he's gonna, you know, I might call once and then give up, but mostly I'm not looking to play a big pot there. Yeah, well, because... I, you know, your range should smack that type of a board pretty often, exactly. and if he's gonna put a bunch of money in anyway, then our pair of aces ain't very good. Right. So I like the way that I played this hand, and I would have, you know, the fact that I flopped top two is somewhat irrelevant. I was playing it, you know, on similar board textures. I was playing it the same. Um. So I stick it in, and I think that. He makes his play because he thinks I think he has aces because he sticks it in with a, a pair and a gut shot, which and two backdoor you know, flush draws. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's and you know the two backdoor flush draws are nice. Uh, obviously, you know he's. I I thought that he was going to have more of a hand. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I raised there. Uh, I thought that was a little weak. Yeah, Especially, you know, but I guess he feel. I guess he thought that. If I'm putting him on a hand like aces, then if I have something like a pair and a gutter myself, like if I have a pair of sevens and a gutter, I'm probably just going to go with my hand. But yeah, that's a lot to assume of a complete unknown, I think. Yeah, I mean, at this step, I think that he was probably shocked that I had the hand that he was representing. And yeah. He had the hand that I was representing. But, you know, that's poker. Yeah. I'm trying so. to think. I'm trying to think what would be the best play in his spot here because i actually i mean i really want to see a turn in his case and i'm wondering if i might bet smaller or just check call the flop from time to time i think that when you bet pot like that you're trying to represent aces that are going for protection right um his Which hand doesn't do him a lot of good here because when you'd come over the top he you know right this happened. part so there's you know the, his problems here are twofold first of all he has he has one pair, but 
in live kickers. So against yeah. So against my, you know, he has more equity in his range than he, his perceived range, which you know he's trying to make his range look like aces, right? But his actual hand has more equity versus the hands that I would stack versus aces. Yeah. If I thought that was his hand, um, but a lot of the hands that I would stack in this spot are going to have him beat. For example, King Jack has his hand in not great shape. Right. Um, yeah. So he's hoping that his kickers are going to all be live and then he can hit two pair or his gutter, uh, which is, I mean, it's not terrible, but if I have a hand, like, all it takes is king, queen, jack, and this guy is fried. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to have that hand a decent amount, and I might stack it or I might play a turn card. I mean, I can play my hand in a lot of different ways. But, you know, I don't think that he's going, you know, by stick, by, you know, if he had flopped really hard here, like he, if he had flopped top pair and a wrap, I would actually like his bet, you know, his pot size bet to represent aces a lot more. Yeah. And that's something that I like to do when I flop really strong is to make it look like I'm betting for protection mm -hmm. when in actuality I'm betting I've to the nuts. Yeah. Which is, you know, the best uh, limit hold'em low content thread <laughs> title ever. You know, the uh, other thing here is uh, it's really tough for him to have a monster in this spot. Like, a lot of people, I mean, even people who 3-bet a little bit on the lighter side from the blinds don't have a lot of 8-9-10 or, you know, 6-7-8-9 type hands in their range. They're going to have more big card hands, so yeah. he can't have a monster here that often. So, I don't know. I, I almost feel like maybe in this one, with his exact hand, that maybe check calling this flop wouldn't be a bad play. Yeah, I mean, he can check. I, you know, the thing is, though, when you check, if he check calls, then he's got to kind of check jam a turn or, you know, he's got to make some kind of play. Yeah. Well, um, I think he can check jam like this particular turn. Oh, yeah. Well, and I, the any thing diamond is, and, you know, like there's a lot of cards that he can check jam. That's yeah. the thing. Like half the deck plus is a good card for him. Yeah, I guess I guess I think that he think I think his thought process is probably, well, it's a dry board. I've got decent equity. Um, you know, he, he can't, you know, I don't actually, I don't really represent that much by jamming this flop, um, because my perceived range probably doesn't hit this flop very hard. Sure. But you're also uh, never folding and he never has that great of equity against anything that you get your money. I mean, unless you yeah. have like, I'm trying to think of what, like what, what's a hand that you could have that he has tons of equity against? I can't think of any. It would have to be a hand, I would have to be putting him on aces and be playing a hand sort of weird. So I'd have to have a hand like, you know, a seven and a gut shot to yeah. have like bad equity versus hand here. But I feel like if you had a seven and a gut shot, you would either, you would float the flop as opposed to raising. Cause I would never expect to get aces to fold in this spot. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I think that, I mean, I think the, the long and short of it is he probably wasn't thinking too much. Maybe he thought that, and you know, this has, the other thing is this has been a very aggressive table. Yeah. I don't know if that influenced his decision, but people are trying to make other people fold a lot here. Yeah. And so I don't, you know, sometimes it's kind of like that monkey see, monkey do thing where he might think that I'm raising to get him to fold when at this table, really, I've just, I mean, except for really obvious spots, I've just been value betting. So I think it's fine. Um, I, well, I, I don't think his play is fine, but I, I can understand maybe wanting to do that. But I think he's way too deep, and he yeah. doesn't have enough of a hand. Yeah. So I end up holding, and I ship a decent-sized pot my way. So, yeah. Um, and that is why you don't always have to... And the thing is, if I did 4-bet pre, I think that he's going to call and then play his hand the same. I mean, he's going to yeah. check, jam, flop. But by doing this, I thought that I thought that he could potentially fold hand like what he had there <laughs> and then i make more money because i'm you know he's 50, you win it you know, yeah if i had dry aces there i'd be 50 50 versus him but in this case i'm you know i'm obviously pretty far ahead so uh you know it's just a weird spot um so yeah i don't know um <laughs> i guess that was just that was nice <laughs> yeah thank you sir um, 
I think E. Martin was playing straightforward enough that I felt fine calling here. Um, I don't. I was think. I don't know if I open this. this hand. Now you folded this one. I'd probably raise this. I would too. Like I said, he might the have been just because of this guy. betting me a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he, you know, every time. In fact, I think that pretty much every time I opened, um, I was getting three bet by him. <laughs> so I slowed it down a little bit. Or I know that every time that I was on the cutoff and he was on the button, he three bet me. And I really just wanted to see a showdown with what he was doing in that spot before I made a play. And so later on in the video, I do, I get my wish. He three bets me and then someone cold four bets him. So I get to take a bunch of notes there. And, you oh, know, yeah. then I, and now I have a note on him to decide that I should be four betting the librarian pretty light. Yeah. Um, but that, that'll come up later. Yeah. So here, you know, we see this pretty dry flop. And I don't know, I mean, there's not really a whole lot you can do here. Like, yeah, we can bluff raise again, but I mean, we've been bluffing and raising like crazy over the past, you know, 10, 15 hands. I think it's fine to take a break for one hand and get back yeah. into it the next time around. Well, the other thing is I thought that E. Martin was playing straightforwardly enough that I don't know that he's just going to C-bet this with nothing three ways. And I don't have – I don't uh, even have a pair. Or heads up. Uh, no, I th- oh, I thought Black Cat called. My mistake. Nah, um, well, whatever. Ways. Yeah, uh, my mistake. Um, whatever. I, I still think it's uh, – I don't know. There's no shame in folding that hand. Yeah, <laughs> That's I, I'm. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm calling because it's a strong enough hand. Yeah. This hand on the left ends up being pretty interesting. Um, I get kind of fancy here. I don't hate my play. I was thinking about it a lot. I thought last this was night. fun. I like. I like. I when you well, we'll get there. Yeah. So I come to this flop, and I already have a read on Black Cat. He. So we played a. We played a hand where on a. Nine on a nine eight six board, he min bet into a single raise pot in like the exact same scenario where I had an over pair and a nine. So anyway, let's. So I just decide that when he bets there, he probably has something. He probably has something, but not much. And it's a spot where my hand is certainly strong enough to play a big pot. Yeah. Um. But it's going to be really awkward to play a hand like this out of position. So I opt to check raise the flop, which I think is fine. And if I can take it down there, that's awesome. Fantastic. And if I can get it in, I think that's fine. There's only yeah. one hand that I'm really worried about, and that's aces with a better flush draw. Right. Everything else I'm probably coin flipping with or somewhere in that region. Yeah, between your gutter and the overpair and the second of flush draw, you're yeah. good again. Even a set, you're not <clears throat> doing that terribly against. Yeah, the big thing is I have a gutter here as well as an overpair, as well as a flush draw. So I have enough in every direction that I'm okay with it. So now the turn – so I have to put him on a range for bet oh, calling right. yes. on a flop like this though. So do I think that he has my death hand, aces with the better flush draw? <laughs> no, never. No, I done. never think he has that hand. I don't even think he has aces because I think aces will fold to the flop check raise. Yeah. Um. So the turn card means that I probably – so he can have 8-9 here. I think that's reasonable right. and yes. looking for a safe turn. Absolutely. Uh, and this I is not one by the way. <laughs> What? This is not yeah, one this for is him, not a by safe the way. Turn. Yeah. Um, I think that he can have – and the other kind of hand that I think he can have is he can have like a, a, a wrap without a flush draw. So something like a jack-10 queen yeah. mm-hmm. type hand. And I think that he's going to have that kind of hand a decent amount. So if he has that hand, uh, if he has like jack-10 queen with, a, with like turned hearts – I'm, you know, he's probably gonna bet here. Um, if he has, if he has eight nine without a, a good redraw, I think he's just gonna check and give up. If he turn, if I, yeah, if I think he so. Turns hearts, like you know, the thing is, a lot of his hands can call, can can conceivably call another bet here. Um, I can, you know, I'm not gonna have a set a huge amount of the time such that. All of his hands are going to be, you know, he's going to feel like they're all drawing dead. And even if I bet $20 here, that leaves 
47 behind yeah. on the river. So it makes for really awkward river play when I'm out of position with these stack sizes. Yeah, I think so, for me, that's that's the biggest determining factor for why you make the play that you do here is because if he does call a lot of bets on the turn, okay, great. Now we've got like, you know, five sixths of a pot size bet left on the river. And what do we do on like a five, a seven, a 10, a jack, a queen, river yeah. cut, basically? I hearts. don't. I don't I've already created a medium sized pot here. I don't want to give up on it, but at the same time I don't want it to get any bigger if I'm going to have to play at a positional disadvantage. Yeah. So And make a really bad decision this is right, potentially. I, yeah, I think that check you know, I think that if the pot gets any bigger, I'm going to feel committed to it. But at this point, if it just if we can just check and get to showdown, I think that I can win at showdown yeah. a very large amount of the time. And I have a lot of outs if I'm somehow behind. I don't think I really ever am here unless he has a three. But even then, I'm not, you know, even then I'm doing well against a three. So I guess, you know, I'm trying. So I sort of weigh my options here. I think betting sucks. I think that check calling sucks. And I think that if it checks through, I'm fine because I've managed the size of the pot. Yes. But if he bets, I'm actually just going to go ahead and check raise all in. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the crux of the hand here, um, is that it's a spot where I don't want the pot to get any bigger unless I'm all in. Right, yeah. Um, and so I like, I you know, I, I thought about it a lot. I like my play here. Um, I yeah, think that I was definitely like, oh, God, check raise. Oh, well, he checked through. Well, that's fine, too. <laughs> um, and then on this card, I don't think that I can credibly, I think that, I, I mean, I could have eights or nines there some amount of the time, but I don't yeah. think that I have them often enough that I can move him off of the, the parts of his range that now beat me, which I don't, would be the, I don't the jack 10. Yeah, I don't think he's ever folding jack 10 here. I don't right. think. Yeah, I, I and the thing, now, if, if the spade had come, I'm obviously betting, but I think that the way that the hand works out, I get a free showdown, and I don't think that he's, you know, I think that on Brick River, he's not going to bet you know, worse for value. I, nah. I think that I, you know, or, or as a bluff, even, um, I think that the hand ends up playing out pretty fine. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I, I think I like my play there. There, you know, the thing is on, on every street, I felt like almost any option was viable. Um, I felt like I could lead the flop and that'd be fine. I felt like I yeah. could check all and that would be okay. But you know, when you have a non nut hand like that, you, uh, you know, if I had the nut flush draw, like aces with the nut flush draw, I'd be much more okay with check calling because then I have a lot more equity versus, you know, and, you know, anything. I'm, yeah, versus anything. And there's no hands um, you're super worried about. Yeah, and the thing is, he can potentially, I can potentially make him fold, uh, you know, a better, the ace high flush draw on a turn check raise or, you know, if nah. I check, well, maybe, well, yeah, I mean, I think that on a turn check raise, I can He's going to get a. But he's going to get a pretty good price at that point. I don't think he's going to fold it's necessarily. Be, if I bet, it'd be a full pot size turn raise. Or if he bets, it'd be a full pot size turn raise. Even if he, you mm -hmm. know, as long as long as he doesn't bet pot. It, but even then, it's not that great a price. It's it's like forty. He's calling. He has to call another forty seven to win. Uh, the rest. Yeah. So if he bets twenty, the pot would be sixty, and then he'd have to call another forty seven. So plus you know, your fifty. That you'd be putting in like you'd be yeah. yeah yeah so the pot would be six yeah so he'd call another 40 yeah so it, you know he'd be getting he'd be getting about you know he'd be getting a little better than three to one he'd be getting like 3.2 to one or something yeah i think he's got a call at that point with it if, especially if it has like aces in the nut flush draw there's no way he can fold there well I, yeah but that's the thing is i already i took aces in the nut flush draw out of his oh game. yeah okay okay but oh. even with just the nut flush draw i don't know if i mean I guess I was hoping that I could. How, do you, how often do you have eights or nines in this spot? You know, that, that was that my was, consideration. Yeah, my hope was that he wasn't going to think about it that much, <laughs> that I might not always have that hand in that spot. But um, yeah. So, you know, that hand ends up playing out fine. Um, I don't, I don't end up losing a big pot. So this is a hand that I'm willing to play, uh, and I. I'm a little, you know, I'm I'm still wary of Puff Puff Loco, but if I got three bet here, I would probably call um, or, or consider maybe even four betting. Um, 
I haven't seen Puff Puff Loco do anything particularly spewy preflop yet, though. I don't think so, I really like calling here in this spot. I mean, I guess it might be better only because Matster is going to be in the pot, too. Yeah, but, I'm, uh, I would probably be more inclined to four bet just because. But the thing is, I haven't. I, I yeah. might. You still, don't know if he's that loose yeah. preflop. You only know that he's that crazy post flop. Yeah, I think that it's a reasonable spot to fold. But, you know, it is a squeeze spot for him as well, though. So. Um, yeah, so I, I come to this flop and I absolutely freaking lutely crush the flop. Yeah, couldn't ask uh, for much more. Yeah, second nut flush draw. I have a blocker to the second pair too. So I, I toy around with betting, you know, somewhat smaller, trying to get him to induce, uh, yeah. trying to induce a bet or a raise from him. But then it occurs to me that I'm actually much better off just betting bigger because the board is so draw that I think yeah. he's going to. Tons of hands people can play anyway. Yeah, I think that he's just going to come over the top, you know, regardless of what I bet if he has anything. So I end up betting pretty big, I think. Honestly, I would probably just pot it in this spot. I think that that's reasonable. Um, I am three ways, and I, I'm not, you know, I think that I'm not always betting this board as a bluff. I'm probably checking it back. Oh, but totally. This guy, yeah. This guy, you know, and the other thing is I'm not too concerned about Matster. And yeah. actually, if Matster, well, I mean, with this particular hand, I'm obviously getting in. But if Matster raises, I think that he has a strong range. He's going to have like a wrap and a flush draw, bare yeah. minimum. Um, yeah, definitely. Whereas Especially because there's Loco, another guy left to act ahead of him, you know. Yeah. So Puff Puff Loco, I, I assume that he's probably either sick of me or he thinks I'm <laughs> full of it. And so he... We should, I should note that his raise size is different. He didn't pot raise it the last time. And he didn't yeah. pot raise it the first time either on that yeah. bluff rate, the Jack-10-9 board. But this time he does. So, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, he I did notice that as well. I mean, it doesn't matter. No. What he, like, I'm, I'm just going to stick it in here. There's no point in doing anything else. Um, yeah. I, and I do think that he's going to feel pot committed to call. So I just jam, um, and he ends up showing up with... A little middle... on the light side. Yeah, he's a little light here. Um, and the thing is, I'm... Nev, you know, he can make that raise as a bluff, but when I stick it in here, he is, he is bluffing. crushed. He is all like he is always in bad, bad shape. Um, because I'm never getting it in with a a wrap and a flush draw here. Yeah, his ten doesn't ever really help him in this spot. Basically, yeah. he um, has the nut flush draw, and that's about it. Yeah. Uh. Well, he has a backdoor straight draw. Um. So uh, maybe he can hope for that. But well, and he almost he has, did. <laughs> yeah, you know, but, uh, you know, in this spot, I, you know, I think that his, you know, I guess if I were in his spot, I would probably rather call and then yes. check raise a scary turn. Like yes, I would like this one, <laughs> like the eight. Um, I'm still getting it in here because, you know, yeah. whatever I, I have a, I have a set and a flush draw. Um, but you know, just trying to semi bluff me in a spot where, I mean, this is what I mean. Like I've adjusted such that I'm just not really, I mean, like I'm either bluffing in very, very good spots, I think, or I'm just going to be betting for value. And I don't think that he recognizes that he recognized that as fast as I recognized what he was doing. Yeah. Cause I, I think the other thing is like, basically whenever you put a lot of money in here, um, he's crushed. Yeah. So when he, he loses the value. He he loses the value of the semi bluff here, basically by doing this. And he would be much better off trying to get his money in in a different way. I think yeah. if he was a complete unknown to you or whatever, like I understand what he's trying to do. He he needs a bunch of different hands to be semi bluffing here with because he's check raising so often. But mm -hmm. it's just not going to work in this particular spot. So I think. You know, if he wants to be aggressive, he needs to pick other hands to do this with hands that might have more, you know, options for winning as opposed to just the diamonds. Yeah. Um, and this should just be a different, uh, you know, completely differently played hand, even within the scheme of how he's trying to, you know, make money at the poker table. The other thing is that if he's, you know, I mean, he's he's basically, I mean, if he's semi bluffing here, he really wants to get in the last bet. And yeah, by, and he by check that. raising and then calling off the the remain, you know, he does not get that much in on his check raise. He gets it to 19, yeah. and then he calls off the remaining 30. So, 
Is that money going to go in good if he's calling the last 30 off? No, probably not. It's much more reasonable that if it goes in as a, you know, if he if it went in as like a churn check raise, for example, it's much more likely that he can have fold equity on his last dollar than when he's calling and like, you know, always going to be crushed. Yeah, especially when it's for, you know, we you know, it's a single raise pot and we bet three bet all in on the flop. Like he's not He's not in good shape there. I don't even know that I would do that with King-10. I'd probably bet call and then jam non-diamonds if I didn't have the diamonds. Yeah. Uh, against yeah. The, And against this guy, I probably would play it like that. Um, you know, just because I... It's just such a... You know, I think that his range is going to be so many semi-bluffs. Um, but yeah, I was really confused as to what he could even have when I have kings so and... So much of it locked down. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I thought he had... I thought he was going to have a some sort of big draw there. With, like, no pair, but, you know, whatever. Yeah, we'll take it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, well, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Um, as always, guys, if you have questions for us, comments, whatever, feel free to post them in the forums. And next week we'll be back with uh, me playing again, I guess. So any last-minute comments for today, Kevin? Nope. All right, well, we'll see you guys in the forums and be back with another video next week.